Greetings, this is Purple Target, and welcome to my tutorial Let's Play KSP series, Crash Test Kerbals, Episode 1, Tac 4, Round and Around the Merry-Go-Round. Currently using Kerbal Space Program, version 0.19.1. .1. At Crash and Learn, we explore just enough rocket science to be dangerous, and learn how to abuse math instead of the other way around, to get our Kerbal Knots out into the depth of space more or less where we want them for fun and profit, as opposed to just spinning them like tops until they throw up. For today's objectives, we're going to spend some time on some more conceptual stuff with just a couple of calculations at the end. The idea will be to get a basic understanding of how orbits work and how they interact with the central body, so that we don't need to waste our precious delta-v on maneuvers when we can get to the same position just by timing things better. So we'll talk about STK, or Satellite Toolkit, which is a program from Analytical Graphics Inc. used for mission planning. We'll talk about orbital parameters and what all the funny names mean semi-major axis, eccentricity, inclination, right angle, descending node, argument of perigee, and mean anomaly. We'll look at orbit types, equatorial, geosynchronous, geostationary, repeating, progressing, parking, polar, and some special types for communications like Monlaya and Tundra orbits. Period. How long for the satellite to orbit based on the semi-major axis and what altitude to set for periaps or apoaps in order to get a desired period. And we'll take a look at Hallman transfers, or shifting from one semi-major axis to another. How much delta-v do we need to raise a periapsis or apoapsis and circulize? This is the bread and butter of not just orbital maneuvers, but also docking rendezvous and interplanetary transfers. And finally, we'll look at space oddities, rules to live and crash by. It's a short list of things to learn and remember to save your own sanity when dealing with orbits. And we'll wrap up with Crash Test Kerbal's first geostationary satellite. In keeping with fine traditions of TLAs, welcome to STK, or Satellite Toolkit, by AGI or Analytical Graphics Incorporated. This program is actually used by aerospace and military organizations for various visualization and mission planning purposes. The best part, of course, is that the base version of this kit is free. Get it, download it, play around with it, and learn more about orbits than you could ever reasonably want to know. However, fair warning, it's used by professionals, so it doesn't make any attempts to silly things down for just anyone. I'm not going to bother showing you the interface or anything here, I'm just using this to illustrate orbital parameters and what kinds of orbits are actually used around Earth. I'll leave it to you to imagine how a tool like this could be used to visualize and plan your own orbits around Kerbin. So here we have the Kerbin analog in STK called Earth. And I'm going to turn on a few options to pretty things up, and more importantly, let us get some perspective in the featureless depths of space. So I'm going to turn on some lat-long grid lines for Earth. And I think those are pretty cool. I really wish that there was this option on the map view in KSP for all the planets. It'd be really handy. Next, just so we don't lose it, I'm going to mark the equator in red, and that will line up nicely with the grid lines for the equatorial plane. Now around Earth, this is a little different than the solar plane because we're tilted on our axis. However, in KSP, Kerbin doesn't have this problem. Kerbin has no axial tilt, so it's lined up with the plane of its own sun and its own orbit. So we'll ignore the Earth's tilt for now and pretend it's like Kerbin. And then I'm going to place a marker on the equator for the prime meridian. And this is just so we have a reference point on Earth when we watch it rotate. And lastly, there's the Earth's vernal equinox. And this is a really important point for orbital parameters, and on Earth it would point at the first point of the constellation of Aries. Since it's so far away, it effectively makes a static reference point in space along the equatorial plane that we can use to measure angles from no matter what time of day or what day of the year. And so as we see when we run the simulation for the day, the reference point on Earth rotates with it, but the direction of the vernal equinox remains static. Now KSP doesn't have anything in the UI for this point yet. No star or anything. No readouts. I expect there's something in the debug menu and mods like McJab and Protractor probably pick up something for it. But so far it's not in the stock game. Sad face. Not having it makes things like aligning transfer orbits for interstellar journeys a little more eyeballish rather than having a number or visual reference to work with when we're in close playing with maneuver nodes. 
Now up in the top right hand corner is a 2D map with a ground trace. This shows the path and position of the satellite as it would appear to the ground, as if a line was drawn straight down from the satellite to the center of the Earth. Where would that line fall on the surface? It's really useful to see what areas an orbit will cover, and it becomes really important to see how it affects the spacecraft's ability to do certain missions. Now I'm going to get in the weeds a little bit about how orbits are built and how you could use a set of numbers to describe them. This is mostly conceptual, but it'll make it easier to understand the little circles around Kerbin or the Mun when you get your rockets there, and hopefully what you can do about fixing them when they're invariably not what you actually wanted. So we have six parameters that we can use to describe a unique orbit. That is its size, or semi-major axis, its shape, or eccentricity, its tilt, or inclination, the twist, or right angle of the ascending node, and the rotation, or argument of perigee, and mean anomaly. So now we'll add in a couple of orbits, and these will speak to the first parameter of the size, or semi-major axis. In a circular orbit, this is simply the radius of the orbit from the center of gravity of the central body. And as we've seen in calculating VO, or orbital velocity, in the last episode, VO equals the square root of the gravitational parameter over R. And then the period of the orbit would simply be the circumference of R, or 2 pi R, divided by the VO. So as we get further out, our required velocity goes down, and the distance that we need to travel around the circle gets bigger. And so the period also gets longer. So here we have circular orbits with different radii or semi-major axis set for periods of 90 minutes, 3 hours, 6 hours, 12 hours, and 24 hours. And we'll let them run to tell us what we already know. Any small radius orbit is going to have a high velocity and a short period, turning inside the higher energy orbits that are further out. We can also mash these two equations together and get a straight relationship between semi-major axis and the period. We get these two forms that we can use to either find the period of an orbit of a particular size, or to fine-tune a semi-major axis that we need in order to get an orbit with a particular period of time. For example, what radius would we need to complete one orbit every 24 hours for an Earth day, or 6 hours for a Kerbin day, so that we can determine the altitude that we need for a geosynchronous orbit. Alright, so now that we've set the size of the orbit, the next is the shape, or eccentricity. And for regular orbits, this is a number between 0, which would be perfectly circular, and anything less than 1 for something that's still elliptic. The closer to 1 it is, the more elliptic the orbit becomes. It can be calculated in KSP by dividing the difference of the radial apoapsis and periapsis by their sum, which I'll do at some point when it matters. For now, we can just see here how the shape of the orbit changes as the eccentricity goes up. I'll max it out at around 0.8, and then we'll set our example at about 0.5. So we've set our size and shape of the orbit, and the next parameter is the tilt or inclination. Now this is measured as an angle from the reference plane, generally the equatorial plane of the planet, and it will be measured on the ascending node, and that is the node where the satellite or spacecraft crosses the plane from south to north and it will be between 0 and 180 degrees. Now anything greater than 90 degrees is known as a retrograde orbit, where the motion of the spacecraft crossing the equatorial plane is going against the rotation of the planet. Retrograde orbits have their uses in real life, but they're also more expensive in terms of the delta V required to get into them, because we need to burn out our free rotation bonus and then make up for it on the other side. The extreme case of 180 degree inclination is seen here, where the orbital path is the same, but the satellite is moving in completely the opposite direction. Trying to do this from Kerbin would involve launching on a heading of 270 instead of 90, and it would cost about an extra 350 meters per second of delta V. Now, a couple quick notes about inclination. First off, whatever your inclination is, your spacecraft's ground trace will touch the latitude to the north and the south. No matter how elliptic, it will only ever go to those areas and no further. You don't get a satellite that only goes 40 degrees north and only 10 degrees to the south. No. If the inclination is 30 degrees, you'll touch 30 north and 30 south. 
Secondly, you won't ever see anything further north or south of the inclination. So if you want to fly over something at 60 degrees north, you need an inclination of 60 degrees or more. This is important when considering launch and landing sites. In KSP, this is really easy from Kerbin because KSC is on the equator, so you can go direct into any orbit you like. However, if they ever make KSC2 active, or if you make a roving launch pad, or they're talking about maybe allowing us to build our own, or if you set up a base somewhere on the Mun or Duna or wherever, you'll want to make note of this. Because if you're launching from a base at 10 degrees latitude, then once you make orbit, your inclination won't be any less than 10 degrees. There's no point in trying to argue with this, because the answer will come back because science. So our next set after determining our tilt or inclination is the twist, or right angle of the ascending node, or also known as the longitude of the ascending node. So we'll put a green dotted circle on so that we can see where the ran crosses the equatorial plane, and we'll change the ran around. Now this is where we come back to our vernal equinox, the stationary reference to some far off place. The right angle of the ascending node is an angle from 0 to 360 degrees measured counterclockwise from the vernal equinox and that ascending node. And as you can see on the 2D ground trace, this has an effect of moving the entire ground trace to different longitudes along the equator. And we're eventually going to settle out our RAN to 60 degrees. So now we get to our fifth parameter, and that is our rotation, or argument of perigee. So this angle is measured along the plane of our inclined orbit from the ascending node counterclockwise to the perigee, or periapsis, because every node orbit is going to have a point of closest approach. This makes the difference between a highly elliptical polar orbit that loiters over the northern hemisphere, and one that would loiter over the southern hemisphere, as we'll see with certain communication satellites later. So we'll set the argument of perigee for 80 degrees, just because. I'm not really designing an orbit in particular here, I'm just using random numbers to illustrate the principles. So after our rotation or argument of perigee, our last parameter is the mean anomaly. Now there's two anomalies, mean and true, and that doesn't mean that the mean anomaly calls your spacecraft names or anything. That'd just be regular old trolls. No. Mean anomaly is an angle measured along the orbit from perigee to the position of the satellite at a given epoch or reference time. So in this scenario, I'm using the epoch time for all the satellites at this year's vernal equinox. So 12.04 Zulu on 21st March 2013. The, the mean anomaly in red is set to about 20 degrees. Now even though the red and orange satellites are on the same orbital plane, we can see that this is having a similar effect on the ground trace as adjusting the RAN. So just like cats, there's more than one way to skin an orbit. Now this is similar to a true anomaly, and that's the angle measurement from perigee, but the true anomaly is for any instant in time. So mean anomaly defines the orbit to a reference time, and from all this information we could find out what the true anomaly is of the spacecraft for whatever time is right now when you're watching this which would allow us to figure out where in the sky our satellite should be. So, to review, any orbit can be defined by six parameters. The size or semi-major axis, which we refer to as A, and is set to whatever radius we need for a geosynchronous orbit or a 24-hour period. Two, the shape or eccentricity, represented by E, which we've set to 0 0.5. The tilt or inclination, I, which we set to 30 degrees. The twist, or right angle of the ascending node, which we set to 60 degrees. The rotation, or argument of perigee, which we set to 80. And mean anomaly, which technically comes with an epoch time. So it's 20 degrees at 12.04 Zulu on the 21st of March 2013. Now, how do we find all the numbers in KSP? Well, as of 19.1, there aren't any easy readouts. But you can calculate A and E from the apoapsis and periapsis. And around Kerbin, we can measure I by setting the MUN orbit as a target. And the rest, mostly we just get to eyeball it. So let's look at specific cases. First, there's usually a lot of talk about geostationary and geosynchronous orbits. 
Now these are really useful for things like weather satellites and communications. Geosynchronous just means that the orbital period of the satellite is synchronized or the same as the rotation of the Earth. Geostationary is a special case of geosynchronous in that it has zero inclination and almost zero eccentricity. So the position of the satellite is stationary relative to the ground. And as we can see here, the geostationary satellite is sitting over top of our ground reference at zero lat and long. Now these can only be at zero inclination along the equator of the planet. There is no other option because science. But as you can see, we're not moving relative to the ground. This is particularly useful for things like satellite dish TV services because we can just point the dish at the satellite and let it be. We don't need expensive tracking motors and such. And then we have this other geosynchronous satellite, but it's not stationary. This one is inclined. How much is it inclined? Look at the ground trace. It touches at 30 degrees north and 30 south. So the inclination is, surprise, surprise, 30 degrees. Geostationary orbits get a little crowded, so something like this would be useful for satellites with a ground antenna that can track a little bit as it shifts around in the sky but the ground station can still maintain a line of sight to the satellite at all times. Now we'll zoom into LEO, or low Earth orbit areas. And this is where most satellites hang around. And if you check the AGI videos about satellite collisions and the Chinese anti-satellite missile test, you'll see just how crowded it is in LEO. LEO is much, much closer in, so it doesn't need as much delta V to get there. But for comms, this is really tricky because you don't get much line of sight when you're this close to the ground. So you need lots and lots of satellites to cover it, like the 66 satellites for the Iridium constellation. But because they're so close, the Iridium handset is a lot smaller than the big satellite dish you would need to show to transmission all the way out to a geostationary satellite. These orbits are also good for sensors like radar, ground scanners, etc., because the closer we are to the ground, the better the sensors will work, and the more detail a telescope or whatever will pick up. And as we go around the planet, it rotates beneath us, so our ground trace propagates with every pass. So here in blue is a repeating ground trace. This is a satellite set for 120 minute orbit, so it'll complete six orbits each day and end up tracking back over the same ground after 24 hours. Okay, so like 23 hours, 56 minutes, and it shifts a little, but it shows the point. However, anything too far to the right or left, it won't necessarily pick it up. I don't know how scanners are going to work in stock KSP down the line, but if you use the ISA MapSat mod or something similar, you may end up with black lines in the middle of the map. And it might be because your orbital period is too in sync with the orbital period of the planet, so you're repeating over the same ground and not tracing over the areas in the middle instead. So here's another satellite in pink and it's set for 125 minutes. So it returns to the start position at the equator after six orbits, about 30 minutes behind the first satellite. So the ground trace each day will shift by about seven and a half degrees longitude. So it'll take a few days, but as you can see from the ground trace, how it fills the gaps between all the blue lines of the repeating trace. Five minutes can be all it takes to fill those gaps. So here's an example of a highly inclined and highly elliptical orbit called the Molnaya orbit, which you may hear about from time to time. This was developed by the Russians, I think back in the 60s, for their comm satellites, and it basically sets itself up to loiter high above the northern hemisphere. Because frankly, at the higher latitudes, geostationary satellites aren't that easy to see from ground stations as they're too close to the horizon. Also, because it's a highly inclined orbit, they can pretty much do a direct insertion into this orbit from almost anywhere in Russia below what latitude? Yep, around 63 degrees north. And it's semi-synchronous, setting itself to orbit once every 12 hours. So it loiters high over Russia, and then high again over North America. Wonder why that would be. For continuous coverage, though, this would take about three satellites so that there is always one overhead. Now here's another called a tundra orbit that runs on the same principle, except that it's sort of geosynchronous in that it, the period is about 24 hours. And it's not quite as elliptical as the Malnaya orbit, but almost the same inclination. 
These are again communication satellites used for Sirius FM radio. And since most of the audience is in North America, the orbit is set up to loiter over that position. Note that the ground trace just happens to fall right over launch facilities in Florida. What a coincidence, eh? Now again, there needs to be three satellites to make this work properly. So here we can see them all laid out nice and evenly in space in a nice three-way symmetrical pattern with the right angle of the ascending nodes for each of them offset about 60 degrees from each other. So we'll run this where we're locked in sitting above North America so we can see how this constellation works. And as we watch we can see each of the three satellites coming in turn into higher parts of the orbit and they'll hover for about eight hours. And as it's on its way down, the next satellite will be coming up to take its place. And we can quickly see what this looks like if we were sitting still in space, like that ever happens. It's a little hard to visualize, though, the effect of the orbits. So there we go, how to describe orbits and how to set them up for every occasion. And if we start making use of communitrons for comm satellites and sensors for scanning satellites, Pretty soon, Kerbin will resemble satellite soup, kind of like this. Okay, just so that we don't stay completely out of the loop, let's do some actual maths and start with orbital period, and maybe launch some satellites. So we've already looked at the delta V required to get into orbit, and here I've rebuilt the Garnet launcher to the Mark II, which is lighter and better without the fuel line problems that the Mark I had. So instead of aerospikes, I've just put in LVT-30s for max thrust, no gimbling, and the same ISP as the 45s on the other stage. So this tips the scales at 38.5 tons full and can deliver a payload of 2 tons to low Kerbin orbit with an estimated delta V of 4,394 meters per second. Now the satellite that we're going to put into orbit today will probably be less than 2 tons, so we'll have even more. Checklist complete. Continue count. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, mark off. Clear the tower. Total program. Roger. So, equations. We're aiming for a parking orbit of 80 kilometers, so what's the orbital period? We know the orbital velocity from the last episode, and we could use that to find the time to travel the circumference of the orbit. But let's just skip the middleman. Here's our equation. Time equals 4 pi Delta squared stage. times semi major axis cubed Delta divided stage. by the gravitational parameter of the planet, and take the square root of all of that. When we sub in the numbers, we need to Continue use 680,000 meters because we need the radius of the planet. We have our gravitational parameter for Kerbin and we get an answer of 1,874.8 seconds. Flame out. Stage clear. Roger, stage. Heading set. Throttle down. Roger. Now let's reverse the problem and determine what period we want and find out what altitude we need. So Continue for geosynchronous orbit, Roger. we need an orbital Total period set. of 6 hours, same as the Kerbin day, which is 21,600 seconds. And we readjust the formula to enter the time squared times Nico. the gravitational parameter Roger. divided by 4 pi squared, and take the cube root of all of that and voila. We need a semi-major axis of almost 3,469 kilometers, which translates to an altitude of just shy of 2,869 kilometers. So, once we get into a parking orbit, now what? Hopefully we're all lined up and all we need to do is transfer out of our target Open orbit. One of the most frequently used ways to do this would be a Hohmann transfer, named for a German dude who wrote about it in 1925. This involves two burns. 
wanted to make our circular orbit into an elliptic orbit with an apoapsis at the altitude of our Taking target orbit, on my mark in and then three, another burn at two, the new apoapsis one, to circularize one. again to our full Stage target layer. orbit. And any things Target's that orbits are, we can work this process backwards to get into lower orbits too. And maybe while we're watching the fireworks here, here's the answers to last week's questions. The orbital velocity for a 4 kilometer parking orbit around the MUN, using our VO calculation from the last episode. 565 meters per second. And the delta dv for the separatrons on an empty stage floor. one, 72.2 meters per second if the stage is completely dry when the separatrons fire. But as I err on the side of safety, and I know I'm carrying much more RCS fuel than I can reasonably ever need for this launch, I'd bank on the RCS still being full in which case we'll only get 66.5 meters out of the separatrons. Now note in version 19.1 they did do some modifications to separatrons so these numbers are a little bit different but I did check for the new design and the Mark II will be fine. Shoots open. Possible malfunction. Confirm structural failure. So to calculate this we have two delta V values that we can get and they're simple equations that just involve the gravitational parameter of the planet and the radius of the orbit that we are in and the radius of the orbit that we're trying to get into. So to get from our parking orbit to the geosynchronous target orbit, first we need to burn at 668 meters per second to raise the apoapsis up to 2869 kilometers. And once there, we'll need another 431 meters per second to circularize ourselves. So that means our satellite will need at least 1100 meters per second in order to get into geostationary orbit. Now one of the other Go critical parts of this transfer button. is how long is Roger. it going to take? That's it. But Little just like pass. apps these days, there's a formula for that. And this will tell us how long it will take to get from the first burn to the second burn and as we can see it should take 83 minutes. Why is this important? In this case it's because we want to put Kiosat 1 right over top of the Kerbal Space Center. Anyone can put a geostationary satellite any old place, but this time will tell us where to aim. That is we need to burn so that the apoapsis is over the point where KSC will be in 83 minutes. So then when we get to the point of the second burn, KSC is right underneath us. And since we already know that Kerbin rotates at one degree a minute, we know that we need to aim the apoapsis when KSC is 83 degrees away. So our burn point will be around 97 degrees clockwise from KSC. That gives us a rough prediction, and we can fiddle with the maneuver nodes to get something even closer. And since the maneuver node system takes care of our time to target predictions in there, we can actually aim this fairly closely and take into account our position in the orbit or true anomaly hey look we're learning something already while we're in flight and we can rotate that maneuver node around until it's in the right position to allow the two burns to happen at the right times to put us in the right spot at the Rattle end. down. Adjusting. We don't want to leave Roger. garbage up there either so what happens when we're done with the satellite? Well we can push it up to a disposal orbit and that would only take a couple dozen delta V but I prefer bringing things all the way back down. So I'll need at least 431 meters a second to bring the periapsis down Taking to parameters. 800 kilometers. And actually I can get all the way down to 20 for Injection the bargain complete. basement price Roger. of 453 meters per second. I don't need the rest to circulate at 20 kilometers because the atmosphere will take care of the rest. Go for so overall I'll want about Roger. 1550 Roger. meters per second minimum delta V for the satellite. And our payload here, the Kiosat 1, is 0.4 tons full, 0.225 tons dry with an LV-1 engine for a delta V of 1634 meters per second. It's not an overly efficient ISP, but it turned out to get further with the fuel available than using a couple of much heavier 2477s. 
So we should be able to say with pretty high confidence that this satellite will be able to get from the parking orbit up into geostationary orbit and have enough fuel reserve to deorbit at the end of its lifespan. And this is why we do math, to make sure that we can do what we need. Throttle down. Checking parameters. So, space oddities, or rules to live and crash by. These are just little notes that we should definitely try to take away with us from today. Small orbits equals the inside passing lane. You'll go faster around a shorter track on a smaller orbit. Use that to catch up on objects in higher orbits, like a space station that you want to dock with, for example. Or if you're ahead, push up to the outside and let it catch up to you. Just think like NASCAR or something. Inclination equals the max latitude north and south, period because science. Complete. Whatever your inclination Roger. is, your spacecraft will pass over those two extremes so to the north and the south. You can't pass over anything higher, and they'll always be equal. Launching and landing latitude equals your minimum inclination. If you want to land at 10 degrees, you pretty much need to be inclined to a 10 degree or more orbit. If you want to take off at 10 degrees north, even though you can follow the 90 the degree heading orbit. just like you would from Roger. KSC, you will end up with an orbit that is inclined 10 degrees. So either rethink your launch sites or plan delta V for inclination changes if you want something less inclined. Direct insertion equals the orbital path and launch site. Direct insertion has to do with getting directly into the orbit you want from the launch site. KSC is ideally placed on the equator and can take into the express elevator to any orbit that we want. But if you choose a launch site at another latitude, you can't do a direct insertion into certain orbits. The launch site needs to intercept the ground trace of the planned orbit for it to work. So a launch site at 10 degrees north is never going to intercept the ground trace for a geostationary satellite, or one that is inclined at 5 degrees. And lastly, the or planet will orbit underneath, so have patience. If we're in an inclined orbit and you're traveling north and you see your launch site way off to the left, don't waste a bunch of delta V changing the inclination at the pole to move the orbit over top of it. Just wait an orbit or two and the planet will rotate your target landing site somewhere closer to underneath you. So that about wraps up this episode of Crash Test Kerbals, about everything we could possibly need to know about orbits. We know how real orbital parameters work, and we know all the long complicated names like semi-major axis just pretty much means radius as far as we need to be concerned. We can pick a time that we want an orbit to take and find the radius to make that happen, or vice versa. Shut and we can lanes. budget our delta V to do Hohmann transfers Roger. and time our burn nodes to get the satellites over a chosen target. Next time we'll look at setting up a polar orbit and an artificial marker for a vernal equinox type reference point and do some inclination changes because sometimes it just can't be helped. So thanks for watching and if you found this in any way helpful, thumbs up, comment or share is always appreciated. Tell your friends to come for the concepts, and then that math isn't so scary after all. This has been Purple Target at Crash and Learn. Peace out.